did you know between 2000 and 2015, the global maternal mortality ratio declined by 37% to an estimated ratio of 216 per 100,000 live births. Almost all maternal deaths occur in low resource settings and can be prevented. Preventing unintended pregnancy and reducing teenage pregnancies through universal access to sexual and reproductive healthcare services are critical to further advances in the health of women, children and adolescents. Unhealthy environmental conditions increase the risk of infectious diseases, which is reflected in the strong integrated nature of the goals. In 2012, an estimated 889,000 people died from infectious diseases caused largely by faecal contamination of water and soil and by inadequate hand washing facilities and practices. In 2012, household and ambient air pollution resulted in some 6.5 million deaths. Mental disorders occur in all regions and cultures. The most common are anxiety and depression, which not infrequently can lead to suicide. In 2012, an estimated 800,000 people worldwide committed suicide and 86% of them were under the age of 70. Globally, suicide is the second leading cause of death amongst those between the ages of 15 and 29. Around 1.25 million people died from road traffic injuries in 2013. Halving the number of global deaths and injuries from road traffic accidents by 2020 is an ambitious goal given the dramatic increase in the number of vehicles, which nearly doubled between 2000 and 2013. Hello and welcome to the video on SDG3, ensuring healthy lives and promoting well-being at all ages. While SDG3 refers to healthy lives and well-being, we can see that there are many issues worldwide, including those in relation to reproductive health, the health of maternal, newborn and children, disease and mental health, which are all dependent on health systems and funding. Health and sustainable development is based on the premise that human beings are entitled to a healthy and productive life in harmony with nature. It further recognises that the goals of sustainable development can only be achieved in the absence of a high prevalence of debilitating diseases, whilst recognising that health gains for the whole population requires poverty eradication. In this video, you will be given a broad overview of SDG3 and its associated targets. In the next section, we will present some examples of the Sport for Development project funded by the Australian Government. The targets related to this SDG seek to address some key areas, such as maternal and newborn mortality, HIV, tuberculosis, malaria, hepatitis B and waterborne diseases. Cardiovascular disease, cancer, diabetes and chronic respiratory disease. Suicide prevention and mental health. Substance abuse. Road traffic injuries. Family planning. Universal health coverage. Hazardous chemicals and pollution. Tobacco control vaccines and medicine access, all the while strengthening the institutions, structures and workforces that deliver these outcomes. As part of the efforts to achieve the Maternal and Child Health Millennium Development Goals, or MDGs, the precursor to the SDGs, the UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon launched the Every Woman, Every Child initiative at the United Nations Summit in September 2010. Every Woman, Every Child is an unprecedented global movement that mobilises action by governments, 
the private sector and civil society to address the major health challenges facing women and children around the world. Preventing unintended pregnancies and reducing adolescent childbearing through universal access to sexual and reproductive health care is crucial to the health and well-being of women, children and adolescents. Globally, the adolescent birth rate amongst females aged 15 to 19 declined by 21% from 2000 to 2015. In Northern America and Southern Asia, it dropped by more than 50%. However, the adolescent birth rate remains high in two thirds of all countries, with more than 20 births per 1000 adolescent girls in 2015. Major advances have been made in combating infectious diseases. Globally in 2015, there were 0.3 new HIV infections per 1,000 uninfected people. Among children under 15 years of age, there were 0.08 new HIV infections. That data represents a decline of 45% and 71% respectively since 2000. The incidence of HIV infection remained highest in sub-Saharan Africa with 1.5 new infections per 1,000 uninfected people in 2015. A major risk factor for infectious diseases and mortality is the lack of safe water, sanitation, and hygiene or wash services, which disproportionately affect Sub-Saharan Africa and Central Southern Asia. Death rates owing to the lack of wash services in those two regions were 46 and 23 per 100,000 people respectively, compared to 12 per 100,000 people globally in 2012. Premature deaths before 70 years of age, owing to cardiovascular disease, cancer, chronic respiratory disease or diabetes, totaled about 13 million in 2015, accounting for 43% of all premature deaths globally. From 2000 to 2015, the risk of dying between 30 and 70 years of age from one of those four causes decreased from 23% to 19%, falling short of the rate required to meet the 2030 target of a one-third reduction. In 2013, about 1.25 million people died from road traffic injuries, the leading cause of death amongst males between 15 and 29 years of age. Road traffic deaths have increased by about 13% globally since 2000. Available data from 2000 to 2015 indicate that over 40% of all countries have less than one physician per 1,000 people, and around half have fewer than three nurses or midwives per 1,000 people. Almost all least developed countries have less than one physician and fewer than three nurses or midwives per 1,000 people. For the next segment, Dr Emma Seal, a research fellow from the Centre for Sport and Social Impact at the La Trobe Business School, will give you an overview of the Sport for Development project. She contributed to the project, which was led by Associate Professor Emma Sherry. Thanks Emma for agreeing to be interviewed today. Uh, let's start off by exploring the relationship between sport and sustainable development broadly and what do you believe the relationship to be? Yeah sure, so sport is increasingly being regarded as a, as a powerful tool in international development with many different organisations delivering sport programmes and initiatives in order to achieve broader development aims. So sport for development is the term that is used to describe the intentional use of sport and also physical activity to achieve non-sport outcomes and positive change mm. in the lives of people and communities. So education, health, gender equity, 
social cohesion and conflict resolution are some of the areas that sport has been applied to in order to bring about change. Um, over the past decade, the number of sport for development organisations and projects has steadily increased and it has become a fam familiar strategy for social intervention, particularly in disadvantaged regions of the world. The actual development objectives vary depending on what the needs are of the localised population being targeted. So strong sport for development programmes combine sport and play with other non-sport components in order to enhance their effectiveness. For example, this could include education sessions with a health focus. Mm -hmm. Sport alone cannot solve complex social problems. Um, rather, sport should be understood as an effective mechanism to, in, in a broader toolkit of approaches and should be applied in a localised manner to achieve better outcomes. Okay, that's very interesting. Thank you. Okay. Uh, could you please tell us about the Sport for Development projects uh, that I believe were funded by the Australian Government that you participated in and that were led by Associate Professor Emma Sherry? Yeah, yes. so the Australian um, Government, specifically the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, has invested nearly $30 million um, into Sport for Development programs, specifically in the Pacific region. Um, so this initiative is called the Pacific Sports Partnership program or PSP program. So the PSP is delivered through partnerships between the Australian government, as, as we mentioned, um, Australian sport organisations and Pacific sport organisations. So the PSP currently supports 11 sports across nine different countries to develop and then deliver their own sport for development programmes. So Associate Professor Emma Sherry and I were involved with designing and also implementing a research evaluation for three of the funded sport organisations to understand the outcomes of their initiatives and to see how they were progressing. The three funded organisations we worked with specifically are the National Rugby League or the NRL, Netball Australia and also the International Cricket Council. So the National Rugby League programme is called Leave for Life and is de delivered in Papua New Guinea, Samoa, Tonga and Fiji. The Netball Australia program is called One Netball Pacific and is delivered in Samoa and Tonga. And the International Cricket, um, International Cricket Council program is called Girls Empowerment Through Cricket or the GET program and is delivered specifically in Papua New Guinea. Right. And what was your particular involvement in this project? Yes, yeah, so as part of the program evaluation that was developed and designed, um, I assisted with the data collection, data analysis and report writing components of that work. So the research design we actually developed involved trips in country mm -hmm. to actually speak to some of the programme participants and some of the other stakeholders to understand their experiences in more detail and to kind of assess the programme outcomes emerging from those sport for development programmes that were delivered there. Great. Uh, so I was wondering if you could tell me a little bit more about maybe a particular project, uh, what the outcomes were, and then particularly how they relate, in your view, to SDG3, please. Yeah, sure. So I'm going to focus specifically um, in relation to that on the Girls Empowerment Through Cricket program, because the main initiative aims connect with key aspects of SDG3. So the program was designed and managed by Cricket PNG, or Papua New Guinea, which is the main governing body for cricket in Papua New Guinea. So the programme itself was targeted at girls aged between 12 and 18, and it consisted of a sport component, so cricket participation, and also edu education sessions, which focused on key health issues that really impact females in Papua New Guinea. So the education se sessions were delivered in partnership with local community organisations that work in Papua New Guinea that better understand the unique challenges facing females in this context. So in order to understand the programme aims and outcomes in more detail, it's important to really set the scene and provide some further background about Papua New Guinea mm -hmm. as a country. Definitely. So Papua New Guinea is a developing country where the average life expectancy is 65 years of age, which is quite substantially lower in comparison to, to other nations. So it actually gives it a ranking of 150 out of 192 countries globally, which is based on World Health Organization figures from 2016. That kind of demonstrates um, the nature of the issues facing the country and the health issues that are facing the country too. So there are complex social, economical, 
environmental and political factors that really impact and influence the health and well-being of people in the nation. So therefore, to address these sorts of health issues, a broad range of interventions and initiatives are required to help achieve positive health-related outcomes. So relating that back to the um, GET programme, we observed that girls involved with the programme, so had been part of the cricket and education components, had an increased understanding about lifestyle risk factors associated with non-communicable diseases, including diabetes. So the education sessions actually focused on educating the girls about the risks attached to some of these non-communicable diseases. Um, the participants also had an increased awareness of what HIV and AIDS actually is and how this can be prevented. And furthermore, the girls exerted more positive attitudes towards physical activity and how taking part in sport and activities part of their lifestyle can actually result in wider health benefits. And that's not the sort of education or understanding that's normally delivered to them. So these are important outcomes because they help to raise the girls and the females awareness of these issues and highlight strategies for prevention in an ongoing way. And in a developing context such as Papua New Guinea, these are quite small steps, but they can have broader long-term impacts on the health of and well-being of females in the country. That's great. That sounds like great work. So thanks very much for sharing that with us today, Emma. Thank you That's very much. no problem. Thank you very much.